everyone for coming to Pedal, Paddle, and Roll, a farm on alternative transportation. Uh, my name is Jennifer Saunders. I'm an adjunct faculty member here at the Environmental Studies, and I've also been working on transit issues. And um, I just want to thank the Office of Sustainability for providing this space and all of our coffee and everything. And um, feel free to, you know, get up and get anything that you would like at any point. Uh, so what, what this is going to be about is, so I want to thank the Office of Sustainability and also the Urban Studies Club too for, for helping out as well. And so I'm going to introduce their panelists and each of them will be given about five minutes to talk about what they're working on and, and why they're here. And after that, I'm going to open it up to all of you. So if you have any questions, please ask them. And I, I have a few questions to myself, but would prefer it if they come from the audience so we can have a good, a good conversation. So it's kind of a, an intimate crowd. So and feel free to come closer to you if you want. <laughs> All right. So any questions before? Okay. So today we have Paul Roof. He's an urban studies professor. And we have Kurt Kavanaugh of Charleston News. So he'll be talking about bikes and pedestrian access. William Hamilton of Best Friends of Low Country Transit. He's been an advocate for buses for many years. And we also have Scott Conley, who he's the owner of Charleston Water Taxi. So our only ferry service that we have here in Charleston. Okay, so um, Gentlemen, uh, Dr. Ruth, sure. would you like to start us off? I sat over there if I knew I was going to be first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I'm, <kidding. laughs> I'm glad to be here. And I, I'm an urban sociology professor and pop culture professor. And what I'll just say here for the next few seconds is the big picture. The big picture I see with where Charleston has been recently, um, where it is now, and, and where it's going. Uh, for 10 years, I had a guest lecture series in my classes called Green and Local. And Kurt came and spoke at it um, about Charleston moves. And I even had Stephanie Barna there from the city paper. And uh, Mayor Joe Riley came as well. And just to say something about our city and how special I think it is, I had never met Riley, and this was probably 2005, and all I did was write a letter to his office. And he showed up outside the education center right before Easter, one weekend in April, and said, Paul, I'm, I'm here to speak to your class. And he said, I am at your disposal. Here's the number one mayor, or top ten mayor in the, in the country, in the number one city, just giving himself to me and the students. And that was a special moment that, that I remember. And that's the kind of city that we live in. That's the kind of connections that we have. Uh, a little bit about my history. I'm originally from Columbia, but you know I have a 44-year history with Charleston as well. I used to show my a picture of me running the Cooper River Bridge Run when I was 12 years old on King Street to my students. And behind me was a Hardee's. And my students now look at that picture and they're like, there just can't be a Hardee's on King Street. That's not King Street. That's not the city we live in. But that's the city Charleston used to be. And the point that I try to make in sociology and brands and McDonaldization is that the Hardee's is still there. It's just at the Crosstown now. The city evolves and changes. The Charleston that I remember coming of age in was one with Clara's Coffee Shop on King Street, with Vickery's on Buffane, with Granny's Goodies, where the Apple Store is. I still personally cannot go in the Apple Store because that, to me, is a thrift store. Right? That's what I remember it as. But that's my nostalgia with Charleston. And we have to realize when we talk about chains and the evolution of the city, nobody complains about Apple Store. But I tell you, when, when not if, when a Hooters opens up on King Street, people will complain about it. Because that brand is beneath us. But Panera Bread's there, Mod Pizza's there. We have what the city paper is called a burrito gateway. 
right? How many Joey bag of donuts and you know Chipotle's do we need? Right? I mean, we're the southeast, not the southwest. I'm joking. Um, I lived in the southwest for a number of years, but Charleston has all these accolades. And we have to realize that being number one, and I put that in quotations, means certain things. It means that Boeing is here. It means that Google is here. And it means that cruise ships are here. <coughs> they're, they're not going away, right? These things are here, and we have to adapt to them. And that's the city that we live in. Right? The market is going through its evolution with cruise ships and restaurants, etc., not making them. But more to the point of this panel today, there is no such thing as the number one city in the world that has third world transportation. It doesn't exist. So those accolades, to some degree, are meaningless. Right? We have third world transportation. Right? Go to the Amtrak station in North Charleston where I go and take it up to Richmond or D.C., right? The Bulgarians, this is quote and counselor, would be ashamed of that, that railroad station, right? Take Carta, right? Walk. I think the baseline of transportation in the city is walking. You are an endangered species walking around the city. Cars will turn onto you, they will run over you, and if you're on a bike, the same thing can happen as well. If pedestrians are not safe, no one is safe. I mean, that's the baseline for me. And yes, if you come from Atlanta, and yes, if you come from Charlotte, Charleston seems like some oasis of pedestrianism. But it's not Amsterdam, it's not New York, it's not Portland, and these are the bars that we have to reach. Last thing I'll say is, what happens, and this is going to happen, when we're not number one anymore? You don't stay the number one city. I don't care how much the... The visitor what happens when we're number 15? What happens when we're number 8? We still have to have the same amount of pride. We still have to have the same amount of civic, civic engagement. Maybe we'll have more when we're not there. But that's just sort of my perspective, the big picture. I love transportation. I love rail transportation. I love pedestrian transportation, bike transportation, all those things. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Kurt Cavanaugh, I'm Executive Director of Charleston Moves. Um, show of hands, do any of you know what Charleston Moves is? Well, great. Uh, I'll give you the boring mission first, which is our mission is to transform Charleston County into a great place to walk around and bike. The other side of that is, uh, I firmly believe, and the organization firmly believes, that nobody should be injured or killed using our streets in any kind of way. You know, walking, biking, uh, skipping, jumping, even driving. Nobody should be injured or killed. Um, on our streets. Unfortunately, our streets aren't really dangerous. Dr. Ruth got to that uh, briefly in his uh, opener. Um, Charleston is the number one city, usually in a tourism capacity, right? We don't see that, uh, those rankings are quite like we see them from tourist ranks, like on the next traveler. Um, and actually, during the Hurricane Matthew evacuation phase, a huge bomb was dropped on Charleston that was missed because of the evacuation. Bicycling Magazine, which is the biggest bike uh, magazine in the world with over 2 million subscribers, named Charleston the worst place to ride a bike in the country. And that is really, really bitter medicine, but it's necessary. Because it's true. It's a terrible place to ride a bike. That's why I came down here from New York. I'm an urban designer, urban planner, and I see Charleston as having so much potential in doing jack shit to actually get to that potential or even fighting it politically. So uh, my work is uh, with Charleston Moves. We're member supported, um, and uh, yeah, we push and push and push for better facilities for walking, riding, and bike. And the great thing about what we're trying to do is it doesn't cost a billion, with a B, dollars like interstate expansions, like 526. It costs pennies to actually to uh, design or redesign your streets in a much safer manner. Um, so I'll turn it over to William now, but that's, that's my uh, spiel. I'll be brief and uh, My name is William Hamilton. I have a suit as good as his, and when people pay me $175 an hour, I put it on and I go to court, and I talk for a living. If any of y'all need somebody to talk for a living because you do make bad mistakes over the weekend, I'm happy to do that. I haven't made any money as a lawyer in the past two months, 
because I've been fighting for a better transit system. And I have been rewarded by the solidarity and the assistance of wonderful people who have gone to the wall for me harder and longer, and for you, than anybody has ever done in my lifetime. It isn't my own flesh and blood. And I want every one of them in this room, they should stand up right now. Stand up, y'all. I want you to thank these people. Our mission is a very simple one. Within 10 years, I want a 12-year-old girl to be able to wake up in the town of St. George, a place you've never even been, on the far side of Somerville, and look her parents in the eye and go, I want to go see Grandma at the beach. I want them to be, hand her a $5 bill. And I want her to be able to get on her bicycle and ride down in the middle of that miserable little backward town and get on a gleaming bus rapid transit line. I want that triumph land to race across the low country through that hot July morning. I want it to pass the fields and the forests of, Dor of Berkeley County. I want it to flash, uh, uh, yes, of Dorchester County. I want it to enter the beautiful little town of Somerville, which has a thriving urban center full of cafes where other people carrying bags over their shoulders with their bathing suits and their towels get on that same beautiful gleaming bus. And then I want it to roar south through high Highway 78, past the fairgrounds that nobody can even go to next week because the traffic's so miserably bad and there is no public transit. I wanted to go through North Charleston, Rivers Avenue that is alive with prosperity and happiness and hope and business for young people like you. Not the businesses down here that have all been bought up by the rich, but the kind of places where somebody with a few thousand bucks on their credit card and what they scraped up waiting tables go, I built this cafe, this is my shop, this is my coffee spot, this is my law firm, this is my medical practice, this is my yoga studio. I want to take the worn, useless places in North Charleston and turn it into opportunity for you. Because this, this thing down here, it's over. It wasn't always over. I was very lucky. In 1985, I unfortunately followed the advice of James B. Edwards and came back to make South Carolina a better place. A terrible mistake based on lies. And now I'm too old to leave. So I'm going to fight them out to the end. But, on the front end, it was a pretty good deal. I met a wonderful woman, had a nice job at Santee Cooper. When I had holes in my teeth, it cost me 10 bucks to have them filled up. When I wanted to see a doctor, at the end of 250 bucks, I was done with deductibles for the year. We bought a house two blocks south of here, 82 Logan Street. You can go see it if you want. It cost us $90,000, less than we made in two years. We got married in a beautiful, historic church. She wore a beautiful dress. It was the second best day of my life. Everybody that we knew in town, our landlord, other lawyers, our families, the people that sold us coffee, one of the few coffees, they all came to that 200-year-old church to watch these two kids with no money and no clue get married. And within a year, we were living in our own home, and we owned it. I could walk from where I lived to my law office in the People's Building on Broad Street. It wasn't a condominium owned by rich people then. It was a place you could get a cheap office. My rent from my law office was $206 a month. The cost to operate my law practice the first year was $6,334. And I practiced law. Mostly I worked for other lawyers doing research for 15 bucks an hour. But you know what? I, could pay, I and my wife could pay our mortgage. I, one of the first civic things I did was I went to a meeting of Charleston City Council to fight for the, for the, uh, the uh, Beltline bus. The Beltline bus doesn't exist anymore because the new Charleston doesn't need it. But it used to go down East Bay Street, around Broad Street, back up Rutledge Avenue and Ashley and up to the northern part of the city. You could go to Harris Teeter to buy your groceries on it come back to my, within a block of my house. You could ride up to McDonald's to get something to eat. You could take the bus to Hughes Lumber, pick up six boars to go on the fence you were carrying after Hurricane Hugo, and take them home on the bus. Heck, I was a Civil War reenactor back in the early 90s. I could put a Confederate uniform on, carry a gun on the bus, and nobody thought anything of it. It was a great city to be young in. It was cheap to live here. At 5 o'clock in the afternoon, my wife drove down from a good job at Sandy Cooper with great benefits. I could watch the sun set over the roofs of Charleston. I considered myself to be a lucky man. And I was. None of that is going to be available to y'all. It's all been sold off for absurd amounts of money. 
the people that make you pay $18 a day to park in places that we used to park for free. Your rent is $1,500 a month for a studio apartment. My rent for my first apartment in Charleston was $300 a month. It's on, it was on Zigzag Alley off of Atlantic Street, south of Broad Street. That is six, four blocks south of Broad Street, half a block from the Battery. Not only was I able to pay my rent on my sort of maybe almost pretend law practice as a young lawyer, I earned enough to buy my wife a $1,500 engagement ring, and I presented it to her the night before her birthday in 1986 on High Battery in Charleston with the moon hung in the sky. That was a Charleston worth living in. And it was a Charleston that had a crummy, worn out transit system, but it could still take me to places I needed to go and I could afford to live in a place where it worked. Why did all of that disappear? Why is it that no one in this room will ever be able to have those things? Well, it's because alligators aren't a conspiracy. Nobody sat down and said, let's make something that's really dangerous to egrets, marsh rats, and deer. What happened is, alligators have been around a long time, and the alligators that didn't work didn't make it. The alligators we left with are really dangerous. The alligators that are buying up Charleston are people with a lot of money. And they're not done yet. Not only are they perfectly happy to have this referendum be defeated because they're confident that they can buy the, enough power to continue to build buildings and houses that nobody will be able to get to because all the traffic's going to be locked up. They believe, they are so secure in their belief that they own your politicians that they're not bothering to give us a penny to see if the referendum passes. Because they figure that no matter how bad the traffic gets, no matter how bad, mad you and your friends and your parents get, they're still going to get their building. But they're bigger people, bigger alligators that are better evolved than you or I. I only made, what was that, $16 an hour doing legal research back in 1985. The Koch brothers inherited $50 million and they've been very busy. Their plan is not only a world where we don't have public transit, but a world where they own your roads. Not only will you not be able to buy the cute little house in downtown Charleston or rent the cheap apartment half a block from the Battery, not only will you not have the Beltline bus, not only will your job not pay enough, almost done, not only will you not have enough to pay your bills, but if you are still lucky enough to be able to afford a car, you'll be able to drive it on a road that they lease from the government. And they're going to charge you by the mile and by the minute. And the fast lane will belong to rich people. Now is a time when your generation has to stand up. I don't know that I can promise you that anything you do will get you what I was lucky enough to have in 1986. But I can promise you, if you don't stand up during the waning years where our power can make a difference, you will have nothing. And you will live out your lives as their slaves. I have apologized to you for the failure of my generation to prevent this from happening. It is our shame. It is the shame of our parents. Unfortunately, we need your help to win this referendum, to win back control of our government, to build a decent transit system. I warn you, not doing anything now means the rest of your life won't be worth getting out of bed for. And I apologize for all of that. I was born in the greatest nation the world ever saw. I was nine years old when we landed on the moon. We held Woodstock and invented the internet all in one year. I could spend the next two hours explaining to you how we lost that, but I didn't know what was happening at the time, and I should have. I was busy raising kids, having fun, going to picnics, and watching my wife play chamber music. I should have been fighting them every day of my life up till now. I promise you I intend to fight them every day of my life until they take my body to Magnolia Cemetery. Thank you for listening. I'm not going to be near that. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of here for everybody. We started the water taxi system in 2005. We went to every bank in town twice. And nobody would give us any money. And we didn't have any money. We just had an idea that Charleston has been and always was a, a water city. So I'm all for the bikes. I'm all for the buses. I don't want your buses to go to the beach. I'd like them to stop up in North Chuck and pick them up up there. And um, but 11 years later, when we first started asking, we wanted commuters and we wanted that um, we wanted it to be cheap. We're the only private water transportation system in the country. They get federal money 
for state money or money from somewhere else. And we do not. And our tickets are still only two months. So are we making a bunch of money? Absolutely not. But we're trying to help solve problems as well. Um, whether that's a good business practice and maybe we're just not very smart on that. Um, but hopefully one day it will come around. Um, so currently we're from Patriots Point to downtown. The east side of the city is pretty much roadblocked from port um, and cruise ship terminal, which I also think needs to go to North Um But we've done Daniel Island, Johns Island. We're looking at um, Park and Ride from Leeds Avenue, Park and Ride from the Navy Base. Um, we have a wonderful river system here. We don't utilize it enough. Right now. So, <coughs> all right. If you have any questions, please. Thank you. Thank, thank all of you, gentlemen. Um, so, do we have any questions on the audience? Yeah, I'm here. Please. And when you um, ask a question, if you can introduce yourself, say your name. And um, I just have, uh, my name is Caitlin, um, and I work for the Office of Sustainability, and I just have a follow-up question. Can you explain to us where exactly the water taxi goes? Because as of now, like, we all probably get on our bikes, walk around, drive around Charleston, but I've never been on the water taxi one. So do you know where the College of Charleston Sports Complex is? And the Sailing Center and everything else over there? Yeah. You go there. From? Downtown. Okay. We have a spot at Waterfront Park, which is, if you've been down there, it's got a big T head on the end. Mm -hmm. That's on the north end of that T head. The ramp is in the water from Hurricane Matthew, so it's being repaired, but um, that's kind of our main location. We leave from up by the aquarium that the Maritime Center on there. No people want to go It's pretty much next to Liberty Square. We have a spot at the Yorktown and then one at Patriots Point at the resort. And do you get commuters or is it mostly tourists? We get we have um, we have a few. Our we're probably 70 30. Tourists versus locals. Like I said, we started off, we just wanted to move people and quickly found out that that was not going to make it. We kind of had to be tailored to what we're doing now. But eventually, yeah, I think that, that's the idea. So, Tell them that's your best day ever. My best day ever? No, I'm on the war tax. Um, you have to. The day the bridge locked up. That was not the best day ever. <laughs> 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 that was the most people we had on the was uh, Yeah, the day after Memorial Day last year, they, uh, they had a tank flip over and it shut down. We had, I don't know, we had 100 people each stop for like six or eight hours. So it was not pleasant. I kind of lost faith in you, man, that day. <laughs> um, I had people, I mean, I had one lady that said, um, you know, we had everybody coming out and you're getting on the next boat. And, we line and blah blah blah. I had a lady tell me she was going to build the next boat regardless of whether she was in the front of the line or not. And um, she said she had a medical problem and that she had to come to take her medicine at the time. And I said, well, there's plenty of hospitals downtown. If you actually have a medical problem, you need to go to the hospital. And she sat right there for the next boat came through. So um, Mark Sanford made an appearance um, and kind of led his way in. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Right, right. <laughs> if you're going to vote for somebody, vote for that guy. Um, Dimitri just take the charming mobile across. That's right. <laughs> but we did the best, and we did it. We knew it was coming. We got to prepare for everything. That was a long day. That's a wonderful day. I, wrote, I realized that I couldn't get home on the bus. I took the 213 to Maritime Center, picked up my son at the college on the bus, and we both waited an hour and a half. But a beautiful dock and then rode across the harbor where my wife picked us up on the other side. I, I thought it was fabulous. I'm I sorry, you were having a bad day. Well, it was just a awesome <laughs> day. Doing a great day. You were running it that day. That's uh, true. But I think we helped me about how to go pick up the children and how are they going to get down. We have contracts with MUSC and ports that if the bridges actually do go down, we can still get people where they need to go. So it's a four year bridge is their Can I ask a question? Oh, yes, hey. Um, do you all have a downtown with us? Can you get shaking? I can shake your head. What's that? We just love downtown. Where do you live now? Same zone. And Katie, you live West Ashley. Anyone else? West Ashley. She's from the mountain. She's from the mountain. I built a car, so I can't. Ditto. You moved the mountain. But actually, Katie, come through too. 
Oh, I was just curious how people got here today. What's the, what's the name of the uh, pedal? Oh, pedal, pedal, and roll. Right, so yeah. I was just curious how everyone did that or did not do that today. Yeah, I used to walk everywhere. I can't really go other places that require me to use a car. That's, that's one of the things I always found, like, that's a little isolationist, or you become isolationist when you do live on the peninsula. I mean, go back to when I did, and I would go for months and not leave the peninsula. And this is when Grace and Pierman were still there. And I'd drive over to the town center, which was just built, and go to the Barnes and & Noble, and do my grocery shop, and then come back downtown. And I was like, gosh, I haven't left the peninsula in three months. Which is a, a good thing in many regards because you can walk everywhere you need to go, but then you don't know about the Tri County area. Mm -hmm. You know, you like people start talking about voodoo in West Ashley, and you're like, where's that? Mm -hmm. well, it's like it's like some far off place when really it's not far off. Uh, one of my good friends to think about another town uh, is lives in Durango, Colorado, and he lives right outside of downtown Durango, and in his backyard is a greenway which is a pedestrian and bike path. He has three girls. They can get on their bikes on the Greenway, which the Animas River runs right through, and ride their bikes six miles, which is not a long distance on a bicycle, to downtown Durango, go see a movie, go have dinner, ride their bikes back home. And in that 12-mile round trip, they never cross an intersection. They never cross a railroad. They never cross another you know, street. They are protected and buffered. There is no reason why a person shouldn't be able to wake up on James Island and bike to Somerville. Protected, right? It is 25 miles. And if you're a cyclist, that is not far. That is doable. And then you start bringing it into North Charleston, West Ashley, Mount Pleasant. If we don't protect people's safety and give them alternatives, they won't use anything but the car. And, and that's what I did. I mean, the great irony in my life is that I was teaching urban sociology at Charleston Southern and getting in my truck commuting 50 miles round trip every day and talking about the benefits of alternative transit. You know, and I couldn't live it. But one of the things you have to do is you have to make a conscious decision to get on that water taxi and give them your business. Get on the bridge. When I was teaching urban sociology here at CFC right after the new bridge opened, it had been open for a year or so. One of the things we did as a class for a field trip, we just walked the bridge. Right? We met over in Mount Pleasant, we got out, we walked up to the top, took a little photo, and walked back down. And three or four of my students said to me, I've never walked the bridge before. And you never would have had that opportunity if it wasn't for grassroots people like Charleston Moves and many others, Jarek Wonders. And they weren't going to put it there. I mean, you, and, and then Riley says retrospectively, oh, look, every day I drive across the bridge, people are out there. People are out there at 6 in the morning, 5 in the morning. Um, they're there because it was built. I mean, it could be like the other side of the bridge, you know, straight over, if people didn't be, weren't proactive. Um, you have to be proactive and make it happen, and people will use it. And hopefully one, one thing everybody should know here, if you do need to use the bus, Google Maps does that automatically. You don't have to fight with uh, with schedules and, and maps. And God knows you don't want, don't want to call Carter and ask for help. You just go to Google Maps, find out where you want to go, and it's just like using find directions for your car. Just press the bus, and if it's on the Carter system locally or in 500 other cities, I just saved you a thousand dollars on your European vacation. Okay? <laughs> it works in Paris, y'all. It works in Portland. Um, but it will figure out the trip for you. It will give you options. The best thing to do is play around with it on your desktop, or your laptop, because you can do more on that than your phone. But you don't need a bus schedule. And you can also figure out when your bus is coming to the bus I'll show you how to do that after you're done here. The system we have is pretty crummy and weak, but it's not impossible to use in some places at some times. And if we don't use it, they will happily cancel more bus routes, because nothing's better than canceling a bus route for Carta. It's less work. It's less money. It's fabulous. They've gotten really good at it. Cora, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, um, I don't. I cannot remember who told me this idea or mentioned it to me, but someone mentioned um, local motorcycling 
um, groups coming together to try to get the old railways repaved so that they can have passageways to ride straight to like Somerville or different places without encountering different things like traffic or cars and different things. So I was thinking like, wouldn't that be a more plausible idea for some type of restructuring to use like the old passageways that we don't utilize anymore? Or yeah. is that no, it's actually quite a common um, common facility around the country. They're called rail trails. Mm -hmm. It used to be railway lines that are, that are then paved and then they become uh, hiker, biker, or, walk, or bike, or bike, or pedestrian trails. Um, actually, that's how I believe that's how the um, the green one must actually get is that or, or, or a corridor for um, utilities, one of the two. But um, they're they're usually kind of tough to work out the contracts with the owner of the property because the railroad line is a pretty useless piece of property, right? When it's not being used in the railroad anymore, it's very narrow and you know it's a it's a throughway. But the railroad companies don't like to just give that away. I like to make a lot of money on that because, uh, well, the business people. Um, so the, there is actually there's a group called Low Country Low Line that is attempting to um, acquire the property that is underneath the uh, highways right now for a greenway type facility. So it is it is utilized, and if you go to Rails, you can just Google Rail Trail or whatnot. There there is a national advocacy group that does um, both advocate for them and then also builds them as well. Y'all do understand that we're going to vote in two weeks from today on building a bus rapid transit line from Somerville to Charleston, like I described earlier. It's not an imaginary thing that we're looking at. This is a live issue that's going to be decided in 14 days and six hours. I know it's like really important that you know, big corporations are taking over your lines that affects not only for climate change but also local business owners, um, which is you know a huge deal. But uh, I was wondering, I mean, how do you think a we, we can help keep things local or move things in that direction, and b how how does transit factor into this public transit? I think when the first part of it with local things keeping things local. I, I've tried personally to be involved with like low country local, um, patronizing those businesses that are local, um, whether personally for me it's restaurants or breweries, coffee shops. In 2001, I sat on a panel for the Post and Courier and the title of it was, I want you to think about what we would say to this now, has King Street become an outdoor mall? And that was the title of the panel. It was at College of Charleston. At that time, there was one Starbucks in Charleston. One Starbucks. And now, if you take into consideration the ones outside of Charleston, and even just the kiosk Starbucks, you are literally surrounded. Now, to talk about localism and chains for a second, too, Certain chains have, you know, prestige and others don't. It's okay to have a bunch of Chick-fil-A's on campus, right? Because that's a chain we feel like is all right, or Starbucks on campus. But, you know, if they were McDonald's, would you get jazzed up about it? No. no. I mean, maybe you would, but if, if McDonald's opened on King Street, people would be like, uh. But if it was a Smash Burger, there'd be a line out there. To be a line out the door, right? So I put it on the consumer to seek out City Lights coffee, seek out Black Tap, seek out Kudu, and I'm just talking about coffee shops. There's lots of other things that are out there, but everything evolves and changes as well. If you look at Justine's, right, and where Justine's is now, Justine's used to be the it is our Leon's is the Justines of our generation, of right now. Leon's is up in the hood by the cross town recovery room, right? But that's where you get really good fried chicken or sweet tea or whatever they have. 20 years ago, it was Justine's was the place to go for fried chicken, right? But then the tourists found it and no locals go to Justine's anymore. You know, you go up 
your local to Leon's, but now tourists have found that and there's a mix, mix match between the uh, tourists and the local. So seek out local things, and I just named some examples in the second part of that question. I forgot. Well, uh, uh, before we jump out of that, I do want to know if there's something institutionally or policy oriented locally that we can do, because I mean, consumer activism I think is critical uh, to building a community of those and transnationals, but, but like, what can you what can you do locally in terms of government to, to you know? I might turn that question over to William <laughs> because I'm not very involved with the government side of it. But I mean but go ahead. Um, in cities not named Charleston that keep their soul somewhat intact, there's something called forming the retail zoning. And it, it puts the basically forming retail zoning is a top down measure to limit the number of the same quote forming the retail plans in a district, i.e. a chain store. San Francisco is the first in the country to do it. And it, but it's, it's double-edged sword there. Blue Bottle Coffee is a fantastic coffee shop and roaster in San Francisco. So much so they have nine locations in that city. That's as many as they can have legally in that city. Yeah. So people want them out of the neighborhood, but too bad. <laughs> you know? So it's it's look at from the retail zoning. I know that local, local first was looking at a pilot neighborhood for that in, in LA Borough, Canterbury, and the city had zero interest in that. Um, so that tells you a lot of things. Yeah. Um, so the city is all about, you know, getting the, the national chains here. That's the reality of it. And what uh, Dr. Roof said is critical, but it's not going to stop Whole Foods from opening. That's spending money locally. You know, I'm not going to go to the veggie bin when I can get a better quality product at Whole Foods. That's the rub, right? So, um, you know, I hate to say it, living in New York for a long time and coming down here, the same market forces are, are winning and are going Unless you have FRZ or you have something that's more, um, if you have the Santa Cruz model, or if you have the Austin, keep Austin Beard model. We don't have that. Right now, I don't, I don't see the city, or city planning, giving a shit about something like that. To dovetail on that a little bit, like you gotta let the local business owner talk about how. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so I think it's a it's a
That's the point where you whip out your card and go, my name's William Hamilton, and we can decide that down at the federal courthouse, <laughs> and if you win, if you win, you can push me off the sidewalk, but if I win, I get to go to Paris for two weeks. <laughs> uh, um, we have a um, I just want to say a little bit. The first thing you need to do is the next time mom and dad come to town, you need to persuade them that they need to go have drinks over at Point Pleasant, Mount Pleasant. You go down and get them to pay for this man to take you across the harbor. Because if you don't feed it, it won't live. You've got to ride the buses or they'll cancel your bus routes. You've got to go buy your eggs from Philo West Farms at the farmer's market so you can have real eggs. And so one day, you can go to the farm and look at the coops and help put up chicken fencing with, with the guy who owns the farm and learn what a pecking order really is. You need to go down and buy your shrimp from Tommy Edwards. You need to understand that every dollar you have is an opportunity to wage an act of defiance against what they're doing to your world. And you should never apologize for it. And when Bilo pulls out of the middle of your city, you call a boycott. You do a petition, you deliver copies to them, and you watch them blanch. And you never spend any money there again. Um, so we've had a lot of focus on like consumer activism, and that's great. But could y'all, if you're going to continue to like advocate for consumer act activism, can you draw some sort of correlation between consumer activism locally in Charleston and sustainable transport? Um, and if there's not any connection there, like, do you know of any like good old-fashioned activism that's going on, like, for these causes? Oh um, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you come up to the old Navy Hospital with us on Wednesday night at six o'clock? We're going to be making phone calls for three hours to make sure that we don't lose our transit system. If you like, come out and join us on Highway 78 Friday after Friday afternoon at four o'clock. We're going to prop a banner up and watch five miles of gridlock traffic crawl by us. Telling them yes, they need transit. What's the website for that, Jack? That website would be, oh my god, pennyfortransit.com, programmed by our own Nicholas Bell, who, <laughs> who works incredibly hard to make this happen and who needs your help. Your voice can be heard in the next two weeks. I can't promise you victory, but I can promise you a confidently waged fight by a man who really doesn't care what they say about it anymore at all. Because I couldn't drive a girl to the prom and I pissed at them. Um, if you if you'd like uh, to join us on Friday night at four o'clock at six p.m. for the for the slow roll bike ride, please do. It's the final Friday of every month, and just riding your bike and walking is activism. It's not joining the herd behind the wheel of a car, and it's kind of a you know thumb up to like everyone that is in a car and stuff. So ride your bike and check out TrailsMoves.org. And check our Facebook page for our events and join us for social rides. Um, right now, we just got done uh, with a long term fight for um, uh, a protected bike lane across the Debris Bridge, across the River to West Ashley, with our hashtag Bridge Equity campaign. That was a long term, three month uh, activism campaign. There was, you know, there was a rally, there were multiple uh, city council hearings, and um, now it's back to the state of the so we're unfortunately not quite there yet. But the fun stuff is right now, ride your bike and join us for our group rides. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And one of the things I try to ask or get from my students is, you know, activism, one of the first things you have to do is step off the sideline. Like, stand up and do something. And for me, with Charleston Moves, I mean, I, I never want Charleston to lose Kurt, you know, because he's out there fighting the good fight, whether it's a slow ride bike or a Pecha Kucha or coming to a class. So when somebody like Kurt, aggressive, open-minded, cosmopolitan comes to Charleston, we can't lose it. Throw it on Charles Dresser, too. But I mean, we have to have people like Kurt who don't say, hey, I'm moving back to New York because it was just too much in Charleston. Right. You know, or somebody who comes from Portland who comes and tries to do many of these same things, who gets involved in activism and says, you know, the good old boy system is just too much, and we need y'all. Okay. You know, but the important thing to understand is this: the potential, the historic core potential, is probably a lost cause. But there are all kinds of cool places <coughs> north of here, within an easy bus ride, where we can build a really cool Charleston. And then all we need to make sure is that if Starbucks ever shows up, then we surround them with protesters and they don't earn a penny. They did it in Portland, 
Portland was inhabited by a large sport utility vehicles once upon a time. People that rode bicycles got killed in Portland. They had crummy transit. They fought a war to tear Portland into the wonderful, weird place that it is with fabulous transit. 8% of the population taking bicycles to work. Let's not fight for this. Let the old rich people have it. Let's fight for that. North Charleston, the Neck, Avondale. Even part of Mount Pleasant could be cool. We've got a cool mayor in Mount Pleasant. Don't ever let anybody tell you that Linda Page doesn't have subversive agendas on her mind. She does. She hides behind a good old girl facade. Don't write her off. She's a smart woman that wants better. She's the best mayor in the region. Don't tell the enemy that. Can I, can I suggest also that, I mean, Paul, you are saying it, it sounds like it's, it's kind of hopeless because the city council has the strings for everything. The city council is made up of people, mm -hmm. and we are people. What we need to do is find good people that can run for Congress, or run for Congress, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, run for office, run for these offices, local offices. I mean, you all may be a little too young, but find somebody like, you know, in their early 30s who would, you know, is, is used to being an advocate out there and, uh, you know, is, is well trusted. And I, I think that's the way we have to turn these things around. We have to get our people in these positions to make these decisions. That's the only way things can change. Or find a crazy washed up IBM engineer with a boat and a bicycle that's been a thousand miles and put it in the United States Congress. But, I mean, look, my, my point is, and what I'm hoping I can, I can prove this year, I, in case you don't know, I'm running for Congress. So, but um, I, you know, I've raised a fraction of the money congressional candidates should raise, have raised, have needed to raise. And I may actually win this thing. Right now, I'm tied up. And if that happens, the whole formula for how you run for office is going to change. And it really is just people getting out and talking to people. Let me let y'all in. That's the way we do this. Thing. Let me let y'all in. Maybe you don't have to raise a million dollars. I mean. Uh, Tecklenburg raised a million dollars to run for mayor. Did he need to, or did he just, did he just need to spend every single day out there talking to 500 people? I don't let, me, let me let y'all in on a secret, okay? If all of the people in this room put all of their spare time for the next days into helping me and Dimitri, I promise you, I am certain, that on the, on the 9th of uh, November, you will wake up with a congressman who has bicycled a thousand miles and the possibility of vastly better public transit. That's not a lie. I would not tell it to you if I did not believe it. And it would put all those crummy places in North Charles where you could build your own city within a 15 minute bus ride of where you are now. And you could come downtown and look at the tourists on second Sunday until you finally say, you know what? This isn't all that great, because it's much cooler than 10 miles more. You can do that in the next 13 days. I'm not lying to you. It's just a matter of making enough phone calls, knocking on enough doors, and talking to enough people. And with him and the Congress, and the money to do something better, we can change this place. Because they use the transportation system. They use it as hard to walk, dangerous to bike, and almost impossible to use the buses to control you. The purpose of the car isn't to move you around, it's to control you, it's to make sure you spend your money on it, that you spend your life in it, that you're isolated, you live in suburbs, that you don't know your neighbors. It's intentional. This world was invented in the late 1930s because men looked at the depression, they looked at the uprisings in Europe, and they said, we need to create a world where nobody's ever going to be able to rebel against us. No one's ever going to be a Nazi, no one's ever going to be a communist. And it worked. They just forgot that it also made it impossible to run a Boy Scout troop or a bowling league at the same time. They made being sane human beings in a democratic society as impossible as a communist revolution or a Nazi uprising. Nothing works. And that means that the only thing we can do is buy things from them and work for them. Work for him, work for us for 13 days. And if you don't get a better world, you can blame me. Everybody else does anyway. No, we can try it again in two years. That's the thing. Every two years, we have a chance to reelect everybody. So we'll just do it every two years until we finally have enough people in there that can change the world the way we want it to be changed. The problem is, in my world, in two years, Carter goes broke. Old people stand in the rain, chilled to the bones, and some of them get hit by cars, walk five miles home from a crummy $9 an hour job. That's my problem. That's why I don't have to. So I have a question.
she let us deal with any of y'all have a question or to each other on the panel. Okay, um, one, one thing that I've, I've heard a couple of times with um, alternative transportation and people, the idea of people not using it because it's a southern culture thing, perhaps. Um, I was just wondering what, um, you know, the divide that y'all have picked up on with the culture of the South and people using it. Are things starting to change? Do you see, like, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Or do you think that that's, you know, entirely not valid with the whole culture thing? Do you see more locals using it? Trend is used when it's convenient and affordable. That's right. what it's to it. And, and right now, sure, it's, a fair, it's affordable, but it's the most inconvenient form of transportation we have. I mean, period. That's no trend is used. And it's not a culture thing, it's an investment thing. It's a, are we taking it seriously or not thing. And um, it doesn't, it's just like walking or riding a bike, it's weather. Um, political, all that stuff, it, it, that, it, that doesn't matter when I think they're reliable and convenient. And right now we're over two on those. There's some buzzwords if you look at um, what Ritzer talked about, McDonaldization of society, but same thing Kirk was saying, safe, affordable, clean, efficient, accessible. I mean, those are, I mean, you use it, you walk around Charleston because you can. You bike around Charleston because you can. You don't take car, or many of you don't take car because you, you know, you don't have a PhD in the history of the routes of downtown. You know, I mean, sometimes when you go to different cities, you look at it, you're like, where is this going to take me? I, I need to. It's also the obvious as hell to get on the bus down here and go to the North Chuck, I can assure you. I would disagree with that. <laughs> I once got on the number 10 bus. If you love humanity and all of its struggle and diversity, all of its disappointment, all of its pain, all of its insanity, and you love public transit, you must love the 10. It is the only real bus route that Carter has is crammed full of crazy, tired, angry, frustrated people working in shitty jobs. One day I dropped a wallet on the tin with $300 in cash in it. I dropped it at the back end of a bus that had 87 people on it at least. I got it back two and a half hours later with every penny in it. Don't tell me to be afraid of public transit of people who ride the tin. Um, there's a magic date that tells us how people think about public transit. It was long before you were born. It was about, for me, the 10th of December, 1973. The Yom Kippur War began in September, and there was a gas crisis, the first of two major gas crises in the 1970s. These aren't much remembered as historic events, but they did a massive shock to the American consciousness. Before that moment, the car was golden. It was perfect. It was the American dream. The people whose attitudes towards public transit and towards race were formed before about 1973. They're, they had two core beliefs in the South. That public transit is for poor black people. We don't do things for poor black people. And cars are wonderful and they mean happiness. Those people are now in their 60s. And they are dying. And in the South, death is the bringer of positive change. Strong Thurman is no longer alive. They're, they're going away. If we push, we can win. They're not going to matter a great deal longer. They're all going to the nursing home. Tragically, they refuse to consider their possibilities. I get calls from them all the time. I live out in Allendahl up a 3,000 foot long driveway out in the woods on my mini farm that I bought to retire to. But now I'm 74, I can't drive anymore. Can the bus come pick me up? And the answer is no. Because nobody can afford to run public transit up your 3,000 foot driveway out in the middle of nowhere. No country in the world does that. Those people will never change. They are dying off. The public, we've, we've talked to over 10,000 people about public transit in Charleston in the past two and a half months. The community is ready to move forward. The leaders, unfortunately, because we haven't done a good job replacing them as frequently and as early as we do, are largely from that old, deluded group of people whose attitudes towards, trans attitudes towards transportation, race, and automobile were formed before 1973. But we outnumber them 
and we can take this now. And if we don't take it, they'll never let go of it. They will hold on until they're 80. This generation has no interest in letting go of the society until they've sucked every bit of juice out of it. The baby boomer generation is going to leave us with debt, wrecked infrastructure, hopeless government, and a disaster. The longer we let them hold on to power, the less you'll have to work with when your time comes. I have a question actually for your official, your, your original vision for water transit. Right. Because, um, I mean, we're sort about water. How many tens of thousands of Charlestonians or Charles, Charleston County residents, even other counties, could perhaps, in a perfect world, take transit on the water? What did that look like for you at first? We met with Katie and them um, the Coast Conservation League talked about that a little bit. Um, I mean, you can interject as, as much as you want, obviously. If you get North Charleston and you get, I mean, Somerville, we can go all the way to Somerville last year. Um, Leeds Avenue, 526, tons of parking. We can get everybody to stop before they get to the city and bring them into the city. We get to eliminate the dollar be a tremendous blessing to the north end of Mount Pleasant. But to really make ferries. James Island. James Island. Right. We know all of them. We've done trips to, from John Island. Um, and in terms of your, your price point, that $10 is from a trip. Right? That's all they Yeah, and that's the sell they pass. Um, I will say, I was just recently in Stockholm where the subway there is quite expensive. The subway is 12 euro round trip. Very expensive. Wow. Yeah. But, and you get yeah, on it's empty but it's clean and it runs every two minutes. But you look outside though and above ground people are enjoying the ferry rides that are jam packed. It's a third of the cost. Right. Probably because of the fixed you know the fixed cost that's built in that, that rail system versus a on the water system, but it was a brilliant system. And I mean that is what world class cities do. You know, that's what I mean Charleston, I mean if we had the if we had the density that Stockholm was and we definitely do not then that could be you know, an amazing thing for the whole region. Y'all right? should see when you get a chance, go on the internet and look up bus rapid, sis, bus rapid transit, Bangladesh. Uh, you're looking for a, a one of two videos about Transdhaka, which is the transit system in Dhaka, Bangladesh, a city you've never heard of, it's home to 12 million people. Watch all 12 minutes of it without all available, ideally, and then ask yourself how your country which went to the moon in 1969, ended up so far behind Bangladesh. And ask yourself who's been making excuses for that and why we keep voting for it. Question in the back. Um, so when I, heard, when I heard you speak about the water taxi, I pictured, um, and again, this is like an entirely different scale, but um, I pictured Istanbul and they have like a really efficient um, system where you have a transport car, it's not a bus car or a subway right. car or whatever, it's all together and no matter what the form of transportation is, the more transfers um, you use, the lower the price gets right. for each leg of your journey. Um, do you all have any sort of, I know this would be thinking way in the future considering right. we can't even get like a bike lane or to move a like park lane of cars or anything like that, but is there any sort of vision for like a unified like varied transit system that would run on like the Charleston car or whatever. <coughs> sure, I, mean, I think it all works. I think everybody would love that idea. We met with Linda Page last year about getting added to one of Carter's routes and, and trying to tie into that system. Mm -hmm. um, how likely is that to happen? I had no idea. Uh, we, uh, we have our organization, the long-term plan that involves high-speed ferries running from McClellanville to Charleston and from up south of Charleston to Charleston, stopping in Somerville and all that we're going to push. Because it's clear that the government officials and agencies aren't really serious about solving our problems at this point. Um, but the important thing to understand is that ferries don't work without transit. The problem is waterfront property is expensive. Nobody's going to build a 2,000 stall parking lot on waterfront property that costs $5 million an acre. So you've got to get people to the ferry with a, a mass transit vehicle. And I don't mean at the end of a $1,500 dock, 1500 foot dock. I mean, you need to get that bus within 150 feet of that ferry. It needs to stop upstairs, the ferry needs to be downstairs. If you want to see this done right, 
go to a great city, a great harbor city, a city not that much bigger than us, Vancouver, British Columbia, and look at the Aqua Bus. It's the ugliest ferry you've ever seen. It's the most efficient, brutally efficient thing I've ever seen. The, the ferry comes into a dock, it's locked in hydraulic, and nobody ties a knot. Everybody walks off one side and walks in the other. It has these ugly plastic suck bucket chairs. It goes in both directions. There's a plastic curtain over the end so that it's heated because it's cold and wet there a lot. And the buses stop upstairs. And then it has the most astonishing fare collection system I've ever seen. There's a yellow line painted on the floor that says, persons passed here must have paid fare. And in Canada, that shit works. <laughs> it's the most absolute proof that they're different up there. So yeah, it seems like there is a little bit of collaboration between at least some government officials and your ferry service and perhaps trying to link up CARTA. Um, is, is there anything else that's going on as far as you know, collaboration and trying to you know, help out these networks and to have a more alternative transportation plan for our city and county? That's what Bill Flax working on. My next door neighbor. Hey, Kurt, I wanted to just add on to that. Um, I've been in Charleston for about six, seven years now, and it seems like perennially, perennially we hear about a bike share for the city. Um, I know in the past it hasn't worked, they've all been stolen, um, but it seems like um, there, especially in these past six months or so, I've been, there's been some momentum built mm -hmm. up. So what is kind of what have you heard about that and where does Charleston moves kind of fit in? Charleston that? moves I mean we're a cheerleader of we want bike share here. Every city worth its salt now includes real bus or real bike share as a transportation option. Not an alternative form of transportation, but a form of <coughs> um, and it's eventually going to come to Charleston. Uh, November twenty second, uh, Gotcha Bike, the company that won the RFP from the city is going to present the city council in the morning. So they're trying to get on the ground as soon as possible after that. Um, Katie, do you have any more intel on that other than that? Yeah. No. 20, it'd be, be Bilsala and close in West Ashley uh, at, at the moment with expansion further out. But starting with 20 stations, 200 bikes, uh, Peninsula and a couple stations west of the Ashley. Um, that's so, the And the bikes were already in town. They were holding them together six months ago. They're in a warehouse somewhere. And they're not going to come out of that warehouse until you yank them out and fight for it. They will already be on the street if somebody just hadn't already decided it would be inconvenient for you to be biking around their so, city. Not to interrupt, but we actually have to close in a couple of minutes. So, um, Dr. I have to Hall leave. Uh, I want to say thank you for being here. Some final comments. Um, I'm going to go to a little coffee chain and start in Seattle. <laughs> I'm not going to get a coffee there, but you know, to my earlier comments. Um, I thank you for being here, and I've enjoyed it, and I'll just ease out because I have a meeting I have to go to. And uh, like everybody said, get involved, and there's 13 days left. And you know, It won't get easier two years from now, y'all. Don't wait. The next time it won't be better.